Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome, welcome to this session of the Right Around the Murray Festival. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that we meet on the land of the Wiradjuri people, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Um, my name is Jason Steger. Uh, I edit the books pages in The Age and The Herald. Um, before we start, before I introduce our guests, I'll just make sure, please, that you have your telephones turned off um, and point out that there will be a time for questions later on. So get your brain boxes working as we have a bit of a chat and think up some curly ones for our guests. So um, afterwards, of course, both Shelley and Marg will be signing copies of their books outside. Now, um, this session is called Killing It. And it's fair to say our two authors today are killing it in the field of crime fiction. Marg Hickey, on my immediate right, as you look at me, and on my left, her latest novel, Broken Bay, features her detective sergeant, Mark Aritti. It follows Stonetown and Cutter's End, for which she won the Bad Sydney Festival's Danger Prize. That's quite a, that's quite a, a name for an award, isn't it? Yeah, I like it. Um, <laughs> Broken Bay is set on the South Australian limestone coast, and it starts with a diver who has got trapped in a cave, and... Uh, when the rescuers come to rescue her, all of us, they find another body there. Um, anyway, I won't tell you any more about that. Um, Shelley Burr, who lives not far away from Albury, won the British Crime Writers Association debut for her first novel, Wake. That was for an unpublished manuscript, um, which it's a significant award. I think um, Mark Brandy won that award as well. Yes, Mark Brandy. Um, for Wimmera. Um, and this year, um, Shelley won the Arbier Award for New Writer of the Year. Her new book is Ripper, follows on from Wake, and both the title, Ripper, well, the title is Ripper, <laughs> and the book is a Ripper. It is. Um, uh, it's a perfect description of it. <laughs> um, her investigator is Lane Holland. Um, in this particular book, though, it starts off with Lane in prison. And I'm not going to tell you why he's in prison, um, unless and so those of you who have read Wake will have a pretty good idea why he's in prison. Um, so the new one is set in a small town called Rainier. There were three murders in Rainier oh, 15, 20 years earlier. Um, but all of a sudden, there is a new murder that seems to replicate one of those earlier ones. So please welcome Shelley Burr and Marg Hickey. Thank you. Thank you. So since, uh, since we're talking about crime fiction, um, why crime fiction for you both? Ooh. How did you get into it? And um, wh what, what about the genre appealed to you? Ooh. Who wants to do you want to go? Who would like to go first? That's always the case. Oh, I, yeah. I can. Okay. Yeah. Do you want me Mark, to? Yeah, go. Fire um, away. We're going to be very polite, aren't we? Yes. Do that scene. I think you go. Um, <laughs> I, ha I didn't read, don't read much crime. I hadn't read much crime at all. For a long time, I was writing short stories and plays. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was a writing a playwright for a long time and then writing short stories and uh, writing for literary magazines and no one read them. And my, <laughs> no one read them. And some of them won, you know, really wonderful awards and um, I think my royalties were like $3.50 or something <laughs> and for my plays at least. And, 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 and I found short stories torturous to write. I love short stories. I love them. But I found them torture. And Is I, that because of the coming to the end? Yes, yeah, yeah. and just, uh, uh, and, and the constricting, you know, each word, everything mm. must, mm. You, you cannot deviate from that central idea in a short story, and, um, and I had a collection of short stories published, which was lovely, uh, but one day I was uh, walking with my family, and I thought, I'm going to try and write something 
just for me. I'm not going to try and impress anyone. I'm not going to try and impress my colleagues. I'm not going to try and get it published. I'm just going to write something for the pure joy um, and base it on an earlier experience of hitchhiking that I had. And um, that's when I wrote Cutters In, and it was a joy. It was a joy to write. I loved it. And then, um, and that's how I came to be writing crime. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it really, it was, it, it was through no one reading all my other stuff that I'd done. <laughs> and, um, and I just thought I'd give crime a crack. Yeah. Yeah. And turned out rather well, didn't it? Yeah, well, cry, it turns out that crime pays. Cry, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. It, really, it really does. It's astonishing, actually, the, the sort of upsurge, isn't it? And yes. In, in Australian crime writing, it, I get a lot of books uh, sent to me at work for review and everything, and I, there are so many I crime know. novels. It's extraordinary. <laughs> yes. Shelley, what about you? How did you, how did you get into um, criminal ways? Yeah, definitely, because I feel like I give very inconsistent quest answers to this question because it depends how long I want to like hold the person prisoner for in explaining the story. <laughs> so sometimes people say, did you always want to write crime fiction? I'll say, yes, I've always loved crime fiction, love crime fiction. It's a wonderful genre because it's, it's a wonderful genre if you love a puzzle. Mm. And so it's so immensely satisfying to read and satisfying to write. And at the same time, it gives you so much space and scope to tell just about any kind of story you want to. Mm. Because, you know, as long as it's still got those central elements of the puzzle and the mystery, mm. um, you can put it in any setting, you can use any character. Um, <clears throat> sometimes if you've got a really interesting setting or a really interesting character that is bubbling up for you, then, you know, well, what if we also chucked a murder in there? and suddenly you've got a plot. <laughs> um, so that is a really wonderful part of it and why I really enjoy writing it. But I don't know that I deliberately set out to become a crime fiction writer. What I did was set out to write Wake. The, the story mm. came to me, in particular the main character of Mina came to me, and I was really fascinated with the situation she was in of being the, the sibling of a very famous murder victim and having grown up mm. in the shadow of that. And so in the early stages, you know, there was potential there that that could simply have been a drama, mm -hmm. um, you know, a literary fiction about grief and loss and not necessarily focusing on the murder mystery elements of it. Um, <clears throat> but I guess I do naturally gravitate towards crime fiction. And mm -hmm. so it did end up being, you know, something of a traditional... Mm. Crime fiction novel so were you, were you a reader of crime fiction before you wrote? Very much so. Right. Like, I read a lot of different genres. I mm -hmm. love fantasy and romantic comedy and, you know, Australian literary fiction is wonderful. But, you know, I was always a big fan of Agatha Christie as a kid, P.D. James, those very traditional mm -hmm. crime fiction <laughs> oh, novelists. Wow. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, as I said, I love them. I love the, the puzzle aspect mm -hmm. and trying to figure it mm -hmm. out as you go along. So... Um, uh, Gary Disher, who we were yes. in conversation with a, yes. a month ago, um, he did, did he send you his thesis? You know, he, he wrote uh, a, a PhD thesis. Yes, we, we both sent out each yeah, one yeah. to each other. Because yes. he, he said that the genre is well-placed to reflect prevailing social tensions mm. that stem from violence, injustice mm. and inequality, which sort of encapsulates it really well, doesn't it? Mm, absolutely, yeah. I think it does. Yeah. And you can, and I like reading, now I read, or the first crime I read was um, Peter Temple's The Broken Shore, and I, that, that made me, that made me for the first time think that this genre can also be really beautiful mm. about lands and mm. with landscape as well. Um, but certainly, yeah, you can, you can take an issue, can't you, and really mine that issue in crime. Um, for me, it's usually female justice, female justice. Um, yeah, and yours, well, in a way that's similar, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, it's always struck me that um, the most contemporary of all fiction is crime fiction mm. because it's, it's always immediate. Mm. You know? Whereas mm. literary fiction, I don't know, tends not to be quite there mm. in that sort of immediate sense mm. of what is happening in society mm. now. Yeah, because in crime, isn't it you, it, you can put your characters at the coal face of what's happening at mm. the moment. And uh, that's also works, is true for setting as well, isn't it? What's happening at the moment, yes. Yeah, well, setting, setting is absolutely crucial, mm. isn't it, in, in crime fiction. Mm. Um, 
and both your your new books are set in and around small towns, mm. very distinctive settings. Um, in uh, Miss Marple said uh, that one does one does see so much evil in a village. <laughs> and, um, That's so funny. You know, <laughs> oh, I would love to tell that to the people, the small towns that I've lived in, <laughs> the small, yeah, so, Beechworth. I'm so, just thinking of all the evil. I mean, <laughs> mm. um, and and small towns are you both chosen them. And what is it about small towns mm. that that is it the secrets? Is it the the the, the sort of muddle muddle up between all the all the inhabitants? Mm -hmm. Is do you want to go? What? Yeah, absolutely. I think that small towns are absolutely fascinating. Like I live in a small town, mm -hmm. so um, and I see that element every day of everybody knows everybody else, and everybody's interconnected, um, and it's both positive and negative because in one way, you know, you're always going to run into someone you know. You're always surrounded by by friends and friendly faces. If you get someone offside, then that can follow you forever. Um, so there's mm. positives and negatives to it. And that's a really interesting thing to incorporate into a crime fiction novel and something that I really leaned very heavily into in Ripper. It's yeah. mm. an absolute spider web of connections <laughs> between the characters. It really is. Everybody's it? connected to everyone else in at least two different ways. And that means that anything that happens in the story, any choice any character makes, affects everyone else. Mm sometimes in ways that they're completely oblivious to. Mm. And so that was just a really fascinating thing to play with. I mean, you're in, in, in Ripper, um, your central character, Gemma, who is, uh, she runs a cafe in, in the town of Rainier, and that's where one of, well, two of the murders actually take place on the, well, just outside the cafe. And as she says, um, when she talks about small towns, she says, Everyone is connected to everyone else in six different ways. Um, it does seem to me that it, in, in the case of Ripper, you, it must have been an, a logistical nightmare sorting out all, all the links, all the relationships, all, all the, the, the tangential connections with, with the, the, the earlier murders and the new murder. Um, how did you go about that? How did you... Did you did you have a whiteboard or something? And <laughs> I, what I had for Ripper was I had a murder board, which was on the wall of my office with post oh notes. <laughs> um, but it wasn't for the characters. It was for the timeline. And I had a column for every day of the story and what happens and then lines connecting events on this day that cause an event on this day. And that was how I kept track of things and also spotted the holes. But... The characters I tried, I made multiple attempts to sit down and actually properly map out all of the relationships. And there is a character listing in the yeah. final book, mm. which was really wonderful. I was glad we could include that because I love those. But I had to give up. Um, the character, because of the different connections, um, it just became too messy for it actually to be a useful visualization, even attempting to to write out a diagram or something like mm. that. And I think at the end of the day, keeping it straight isn't as important as understanding just how closely enmeshed everyone is. Mm. Like, as mm. a system, um, <clears throat> they are very tightly interlinked, and that is what drives the story. And you don't necessarily have to understand every precise link between them to mm. follow mm. that. No, no, that's true. That's true. It's interesting. Sorry, uh, no, no. it's interesting about. Sorry, <laughs> uh, I was going to say what you're saying, Shelley. It's so interesting the interconnections and the the web of of web of small country towns. But what I'm finding in the towns that I've lived in and, and that I live in now is that that. Country towns are changing. Mm. They're, they're no longer that whole... And sometimes I get a bit cross with, um, with rural fiction and how people depict rural... Gary Disher and I talk about this <laughs> and how people um, depict country towns because you're right, there is that interconnected web. But also there's an awful lot of change in country towns that we don't talk about. You know, there's a lot of people moving out. There's been this whole tree change in... Mm -hmm. Small mm -hmm. towns around here, people who live in small towns around here will absolutely know that. That, yes, there are the old families, but there is a whole 
there's a whole new population in small towns too. Like everywhere else, people move in and people move out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not always static, and that's mm -hmm. how it sometimes I mean, in, in a sense, in, in Broken Bay, you, ch you choose to set it... I mean, it's an extraordinary location. Um, oh, isn't could it? you tell us a little oh, bit I've about been there. the Limestone Coast? Oh, so I, I, I really hope all of you go, go there um, these holidays <laughs> because it's the most uh, amazing setting. It's the Limestone Coast, so from about south, Mount Gambia at south and then across to about Nelson in Victoria, although they're finding sinkholes in... My aunt has a sinkhole on her property in Bridgewater. In Bridgewater. But um, so it, there's 50 known sinkholes and the sinkholes, they're, they're in dairy paddocks. So some of them, Jason, are from, from you to me, you know, uh, and they're rare. And when you look in, the colour is the, the same colour as my shoe, the water. And it's like a Grecian myth. And underneath, there is chasms half the size of the MCG. And they leave it off through squeezes and restrictions to other chasms and other caverns. And they're called cathedrals because they're so beautiful. And, and the water, the visibility in our sinkholes in Australia is the best in the world. Um, it's just, oh, it's an amazing place, yeah. And the cows are, oh, it's great. And sometimes I met some farmers who have sinkholes on their property, but they don't tell anyone about them because they don't want young kids dying on their mm, property mm. and because they chuck old car parts down there. <laughs> Um, and, you know, there's old tractor parts and you wouldn't believe the things that are down those sinkholes. But so, um, I mean, in, in a sense, um, the, the, the setting becomes a sort of metaphor for what's going on, doesn't it? Because under the surface... Yeah, the subterranean yeah, world. That's yes. right. Yeah. Um, so you, you investigated those sinkholes? Did you, yeah, you didn't I, actually... I, I don't, I'm not a cave diver. My brother has cave dived, so, oh. but I'm not a cave diver. I've snorkelled in quite a few of them, Ewan's Ponds and Piccaninny, if, if you know. So I know them and I know mm. the area from, from where my, when my mum grew up around yeah. there. I knew the sinkholes and I've swum in them and, and jumped off, you know, clipped the rocks into them. But no, I've never cave dived. I, I've, I've talked to lots of cave divers, yeah. though, and it's yeah. just... Uh, and and for, um, for Broken Bay, I went and read the coroner reports, or the reports of every single cave diving death in Australia, and then I became... Um, and then one night I woke up and I'd had my pillow on my face, <laughs> and, I was going, <laughs> and, and I thought, I've got to stop that. So, yeah, I didn't know whether it was... Yeah, it was me doing it, not, not my husband. But, but in a sense... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In a sense... Um, you're not, your focus is not so much on the small town, but on two families, mm. two interlinked families. Yes, it? yeah, and Shelley does that so well in, um, what, with, her, with her web of people. But yes, I have the Doyles and the Sinclairs, and I think that's pretty true. You know, I could choose to... Where I used to live in Patuolic, there was two families, we used to call the Murdochs and the Packers, <laughs> because they were... And in, in every town, there are the, sort of those two families, usually wealthy landowners where the fortunes have risen mm. and fallen, and the kids all know each other. Some of the kids get sent off to boarding school, others stay where the... So the fortunes shift and change. In this case, it's the dairy farmers and the lobster fishing, mm. and there is a, can be real conflicts particularly with the sale and um, buying of land, particularly when you know the people or when your friends, childhood friends, and you buy up the land of the former families. I, I, I know this from experience. Yeah, it can be fraught. <laughs> so this is the third, um, third outing for your protagonist, mm. Mark Aritti. Yes. And Shelley, uh, second... I mean, Gemma and Mina in, in the first book are, the, are sort of the focuses, but this character, Lane Holland... Is there? He's an investigator of uh, an, an unconventional investigator, I suppose we could say. Um, could you both tell me about the genesis of the of your, those two protagonists? Yeah, absolutely. So, with <clears throat> Lane originated in the first book, Wake, and so with Wake, I very much started out with that. Um, the Mina character, she was the absolute first thing to come and everything else accumulated in support of that character in her story. And she was this immovable object who had settled into a lifestyle, um, you know, she had lost her sister, she didn't know the truth about what had happened to her and had come to a place where she was no longer willing to try to find out. She'd tried before, so many different investigators had tried, it had only ended in pain for her family, 
she was happy to just live with her grief and with the not knowing. And so I needed, if she's an immovable object, I needed an unstoppable force to come in <laughs> and knock her out of her, comf not comfortable, her tolerable situation. Um, and so that was where Lane Holland came in. And I had been reading about private investigators who, rather than um, being hired on a per diem or put onto a case by a family, they look at cases with large rewards attached. And so they will attempt to resolve them, and their way of making a living is to collect the rewards for finding information. So it's a bit like a bounty hunter. A bit like a bounty hunter, yeah. yeah. So it, that was just such a really fascinating idea to me. Um, quite often, those, ca those kind of people in real life are retired detectives and police officers. So they've had a long career and... It doesn't um, sound legal. Is it legal? <laughs> do people do that, actually? It requires a licence. Right. Yeah. Um, so private, private investigators are licensed, right. which is certainly going to be a problem for Lane in the future. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, and in real life, they tend to be older people and retired police officers. Um, with Lane, he is definitely not in that position. He is younger, but I needed to come up with a character who had those skills, but for some reason had chosen not to pursue it into a career in the police, and for some reason had decided to pursue this much more tenuous career, trying to collect bounties, as it mm. were. And so he needed a backstory, and it Such all flowed from character. there. Mm. And, and in... Now, I don't want to give, a, give things away, <laughs> but... Um, with, in, in, in the new book, Lane is incarcerated. That's, that's right. Not ruin, that's, that's not a spoiler, is it? No, because it is in the blurb of Ripper. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that they are, they're two standalone novels, which is a really great thing about crime fiction, is that you get a complete story in each book. And um, that's what I always loved about them growing up, is if you found a seventh book in a series, you could just pick it up and still enjoy it mm. um, as its own thing. So you can read Ripper and Wake in either order. Um, if you read Ripper first and then pick up Wake, you might find yourself wondering how on earth this character ended up in the position you'd found them in in Ripper. It's, you know, it kind of like it functions as a prequel if you mm. read Ripper first. So in the writing of, of, of Ripper then, having him in jail, was that, was that a, a hindrance or was that actually um, something that that added in terms of your writing, that gave you, gave you a bit of um, a spark to the writing? Absolutely. I think that in writing and in any kind of art, a hindrance can be really beneficial. It forces you to work within restrictions and you have to be creative. And sometimes the best stories can come out of that. And with Ripper, I was working with one of my absolute favourite tropes, which is the serial killer who is dying and there is a ticking clock that they have to get information out of him before it's gone forever. And so for that so story, a private investigator who is also in prison is actually a really great, <laughs> <laughs> great tool yeah. for a writer to use. Yeah. So, but the, the fact that he was in prison came first. That's right, yes. <laughs> that was just a natural flow of his story, and then from there I had to figure out where that character would go next. Concentrated the mind. Mm. Yeah. Marg, what about Mark Ariti? Yeah, well, so Mark, I... Well, when I started to write, I, when I thought I'll give this thing a crack, mm. I um, didn't plan, so I don't really... I had an idea of a person, uh, and I wanted to do... Um, I'm surrounded by men in my life. I've got three big... Bulk, bulky teenage boys and, and a lovely husband and I've got lots of brothers and uncles and, and I've, I've had the good fortune to have good men in my life. Um, I, I hate one ex-boyfriend, but <laughs> apart from that, I, 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 like, I like them all. And, um, and, and I teach, you know, I, I'm a teacher, so I, I have good, you know, students and, and, mm. and who I teach. But I wanted to write um, someone who is a good bloke but who is flawed but who is coming to realise through, because that they're a good bloke and they're big and they've got a good handshake and they're friendly, that they've had certain privileges in life just from that. Mm -hmm. So someone who is kind of coasted 
on his friendly personality, his, um, his, his goodwill to others. He does stuff up. He does some awful things. But, but people like him and he likes people mm. and he's a curious person. But he's coming to realise, and, and my book's a standalone too, mm. but there's certain a, a trajectory with Mark's life that he's coming to realise that he, that others around him certainly do not have, have not had as good fortune and he's slowly coming to a kind of reckoning in his personality and understanding how, just how easy he's had it. Mm -hmm. mm. And so are you, um, is he your serial character for the next few books? Well, I was talking about this to Gary, to Gary right. Disher, because I sort of thought in my third one in Broken Bay, I thought... Um, well, should I shoot him or something in the end of, <laughs> or kill him? And, um, and my publisher said, uh, please don't. Not, <laughs> but I not thought, just I, yet. Yeah, but I didn't want to be that person who, you know, like, I don't know, like, like 20, 20, 20 years on and Margarita is still, and everyone's sick of him or sort of. So I thought I'd give a new one, a new right. So the one I'm writing now is a very different character. Mm -hmm. But I, I was talking about this to Gary and he said, with his Hirsch, and he said, well, do you like Margariti? And I said, yes, I've got 50,000 stories of Margariti. And he said he really likes Hirsch, so he said, keep writing them. So I mm. think after this one, I'll, I'll go back maybe mm. Um, mm. And, and give him another go. Yeah. I don't think I'm finished with him yet. <laughs> what about you, Shelley? Will Lane... Lane Please, here. Lane. You need more Lane. <laughs> yeah, it's actually really interesting because that's precisely the way that I feel, is that I... There is definitely at least one more Lane Holland book in the offing, mm. and that will be the Lane Holland book. Mm. Um, the first two, they're dual point of view. Yep. Mm. Um, the second one, for now, is purely Lane's point of view. Mm. The third one um, is really his book, and the one that's, you know he's not so much a supporting character anymore. It's a story about him mm. and him figuring out what exactly he wants to do next and having a good hard look at himself. Um, but right in the planning of Ripper, I wasn't sure that he would be in it. Um, I certainly had an idea of how he could work as part mm. of the story, but at that time, I had absolutely no idea how readers were going to receive him. And I was a little bit worried that it was a crutch that it was a mm. character whose voice I was already familiar with, I'd learned to write in, am I just retreating back to the familiar? Mm. And yeah, it's exactly like, um, um, do I want to be 20 books in to Lane Holland and you know, nobody wants to hear me mm. tell anybody else's story? Yeah. But at the same time, um, whenever I am coming up with new stories, he's always, he's always there got a part to play. <laughs> <laughs> I can always think of ways he could come back in. That's but it's, it's, mm. it is clever the way you have. Um, mm. you know, he's, he's sort of tangential, isn't he? Mm. I mean, very significant, but tangential. Mm. And I guess, uh, I mean, I always think about um, Ian Rankin's um, mm. Rebus. Rebus character, who... He must be about 100 now, well, Rebus. <laughs> he's, it's, he's extraordinary. I mean, he has, he does... He does age him, mm. doesn't he, I think. Yes. I, it's a while since I've read one, but mm. he must have written at least 20 mm. books about, of, mm. about readers. And, and I think you and I have talked about this um, before, Jason, maybe, but I made a grave mistake with Margariti in Cutters End by naming his age. Ah. And, um, I mean, is it a grave mistake? I don't know, but, you know, it's... So, someone has said that they worked out Jack Reach or should be about, like, 140 by now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, because he did name his age yeah, in the yeah. first one. But, uh, yeah, I've heard that you don't shouldn't mention their names, well, their I, age. I think you... Mm. Isn't he 51? Mark? Yes. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. He's well, got a while He's go. got a long... You know, yeah. He's got a long... He's I'll, got a long life ahead of him, I think. <laughs> um, so, going back to the question of setting... Mm. How do you determine where you want to set your, set your book? I mean, does it come, what comes first? The, 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 the basis of the plot? Mm. Or do you think, well, you know, in, in your case, you know, the limestone coast, mm. that'd be a brilliant place to mm. set it. You know, I've got to come up with a plot mm. now. I mean, um, chicken or egg, is it? Or? What, what, what about you, Shelley? Yeah. It's usually idea first for me. I'm looking at characters who are in a particular situation. That's usually what sparks mm. things for me. And in the planning of Ripper, I, when, 
where the first spark of that idea came from, I was reading an ABC article about, and I always want to be really clear um, that <clears throat> Rainier is an entirely fictional town and the murders are entirely fictional and they're in no way based on any real murders. But the original spark of the idea came from reading an article about Snowtown in South Australia, which um, <clears throat> an Australian audience always immediately thinks of one thing when I say the name of that town. And this article was interviewing people who live in Snowtown and, and love living in Snowtown, but are very aware of that infamous association. And so just trying to grapple with the decision of, do we try to pull away from it, maybe even rename the town, rebrand, um, or do we lean into it? People come to Snowtown wanting to take selfies in front of the bank. <laughs> and, like, do we encourage that so that people will come into town and spend money in our businesses? And so, from there, the idea of Ripper was born. Um, and I knew right away that the sort of town it was going to be was one of those Australian highway towns. And I travelled a lot growing up because my parents... Uh, one of my parents lived in Newcastle and the other parent lived in Glen Rowan. So that's about an eight hour drive every time we did a switch over. Um, so I really grew up very familiar with those sorts of towns that you just stop in for a couple of minutes. And they're all so beautiful mm. and they're also, they've always got something about their history that they're intensely proud of. And <clears throat> so I really wanted to capture that sort of town. And um, I was driving Canberra to Albury and stopped in at the town of Tarkutta, which is exactly halfway between Melbourne and Sydney, which I thought, that's a really fascinating point of interest, isn't it? <laughs> and so I've stolen that. Um, I don't like to take a real town and give it a horrible history. Like, I don't think that's a fair thing to do. Um, but I don't think... Like, <laughs> I've noticed that people react a little bit like, so you've just wiped Tarkata off the map and put a <laughs> fake town there. Like, I'm not sure that maybe that's a dip, not the right way to go after all. <laughs> yeah. So what, ha what happened in, in Snowtown? Do they have a tour like, like you do in, in... Do they have... No, they no. don't. But they also haven't renamed it, so... Yeah. Yeah. And then Glen, Glen Rowan, you, obviously there's the association with with Ned Kelly and everything. Absolutely. So they, whereas they might, um, in Glen, Glen Rowan, they might, there might be more of that sort of thing than... Mm. Absolutely. And I mean, Glen Rowan has the benefit that it's a, it's a fascinating and dark part of history that brings people to town, but nobody's hurt by that. Mm. There aren't, you know, uh, the, those who are descended from the people involved uh, seem to be quite supportive of the tourism aspect. Oh, they love it. Yeah, and yeah. there's no grieving families who feel like they're being taken advantage of. It's mm. that distance. It's the distance. Oh, you, the distance. you can't step, step, make one step in Glen Rowan without seeing a tea towel with Ned Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, what about you? Did you sort of land on the limestone yeah, coast, no, so to speak? I, I, I'm always setting everywhere, everywhere. It's always everything I've ever written, ever it's since all, I was a kid. It's all setting. It's always setting first. I love, I love setting so much. I love landscape. And it's probably why I've always lived rural, in mm, rural towns, mm. always. Um, you, Cutter's End was the... The, the, Stuart, the Stuart Highway, mm. um, where I spent a lot of time. That was c comes from your hitchhiking. From my hitchhiking, yeah. Well, I used to do a lot of hitchhiking and work in small pubs and, and do various probably terrible things that I wouldn't recommend people, but uh, up and down there. And then um, Stonetown um, is kind of a little bit borough in South mm. Australia, but more so the um, Mount Chilton Pilot National Park, which people here would know very well because mm. the Ninox Conovens, the Barking Owl, um, and is so, yeah. Where the body, they yes, find yeah, the body. Yes, yeah, and the mine mm, shafts, mm, you know, around. Mm. And then this new one, um, that, uh, oh, and Broken Bay, of course, the limestone mm. coast where my mother's family's from. So I always try to, to choose a setting that I know, that I'm familiar with, and, um, and that I love, I suppose, that mm. I, that I, yeah, that I... And that um, you're very familiar with. Because, yes. I mean, it's not just scenery, is it? No. You've got to play, uh, your setting 
has got to ch play a, a yes, gigantic part because in, a sinkhole in the plot is not and, just a sinkhole, is it? Mm. Or a, or an old Blakely gum in a paddock is not just a beautiful old Blakely in in the paddock. It's it's so much more. Mm, yeah. Mm, mm. Mm. So uh, when you were hitchhiking, mm. uh, <laughs> I do remember a story um, that you wrote in which you were, you were hitchhiking with your cousin mm. and oh, gosh, yes. you got picked up by... Was this in the age? It was. Yes, I remember that. And, uh, oh, yeah. That was terrible. The, I mean, the story about the $70. Yes. Can yeah. you tell us that story? Should I tell it? Yeah, yeah. I think, you I think you should. Okay. <laughs> it, it, I'm here, so it ends. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, well, my cousin and I were hitchhiking. We were 19, and we were trying to get to Darwin to get a flight across to Timor, and, um, and we were going to travel. This was our plan. I think it was 1991 or something. Uh, there's, uh, and we were in Port Augusta, and we were planning to get to Cooper Pedy. It was getting around 4 o'clock, so, you know, it was a silly time. It was a long way to Cooper Pedy, and we said, let's walk back to the road station and then we'll wait for a bus or we'll hitchhike back into Port Augusta and stay the night in the pub or in a backpackers or something. And um, it was sort of, you, you know, those amazing evenings in that, mm. in that Stuart Highway. It was, it was hot. And, um, and a ute pulled up, an old ute pulled up with a, a young man in it, um, probably, probably early 20s, older than us, very pale, uh, long hair, kind of a bit of a mullet probably, he might have been in his 30s, I can't, but he was pale. He was a little bit unsavoury, but he said, he said, where are you going? And we said, um, I was going to say cutters in. And, and we, said, <laughs> we said Cooper Pedy, and he got, and we said, got in, and he threw both of our backpacks in the back of the ute. We got in the front seat of the ute with him, and then he um, started driving, and he didn't say one word to us. He didn't say one word, um, and, and it was hours <laughs> hours and at the start we were giggling, we were nudging each other, we were using all our feminine guile. Oh, thanks so much for picking us up. You know, thank you. Oh, you're so, this is so great. Yeah. You know, we were, none of that was working. Nothing was working. <laughs> and, and it usually does when you're 19, but it wasn't working. And, um, and it, it was a bit scary. And mm. it got to the stage when it was pitch black, at, as you know, dead. And, uh, he and I thought not one car has passed us and not and we haven't passed one car <laughs> and he pulled over to the side of the road he pulled over to the side with all that there was that low salt bush you know that it looks like people crouching and he threw both of our backpacks out and he said um and we we're standing there and he said one of you has to have sex with me or you have to give me $70 each and um, I, I, I didn't understand it. Like I was ninth. I said, and we said, we don't have seventy dollars, which kind of <laughs> makes us laugh afterwards. We don't have seventy dollars, and and we said no, <laughs> um, no, and it was scary. And we thought, um, do we do we run? And we said, and Josie, no, we said no, we'll stand. So we said no, and he got in the car and drove off in his ute and drove off very slowly. And then we thought, what do we do? So we put our backpacks behind the salt bush and we went and stood beside the salt bush and every few minutes we'd come out and we would put our ears to the road because we're seasoned hitchhikers. <laughs> and, we know, and we know that you can hear a road train coming from, from 20 kilometres away, you can hear. And we put out and we would wait to hear that, you know, that welcome rumble we hoped would come and which didn't come. But, um, and then after about... 30 minutes, a uh, slow light came up the highway, slow light again, pitch black, he turned around and it was him. And he wound down his window and he said, I was only joking, get in. And we got in. <laughs> we said, oh, you really had us there. Locked the doors and he drove us to Cooperpedia and we were the we had the best night that night at the pub. We were telling everyone. It was only later when I started thinking, when the Bradley Murdoch actually, and when mm. Ivan Milat was around mm. the same time, I thought, Ooh. my gosh, you know, what? Well, yeah. Anyway, but we got back in. We were so trusting. 
Mm. And uh, what would you say if your kid said, oh, we're going to hitch up to Darwin? Uh, yeah, I would say, um, you know, I don't want to dissuade them in a way. No, no, no. I, I don't, because there's something... There's something wonderful about youth, about that exuberance and adventure. I, I would say be really careful and, and have a good pocket knife and go with yeah. a friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't say no, actually. <laughs> I, I mean, when I hitchhiked, I used to really enjoy it. Yeah. Really enjoy it. Yeah. Um, we hitchhiked with Bob Hawke's son once. <laughs> yeah. Ah. He was really keen on my cousin. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no hitchhiking stories in your, in your past, Shelley? No. Not no. fed into the books? I was, I was never that, that interesting, unfortunately. I have an Ivan Milat story. Oh, um, God. Yes, you were. <laughs> Not specifically. Like, I did grow up in Newcastle, so everybody's connected uh, to Ivan Milat. Like, you know, one of my mother's friends dated him for a while. Um, and <laughs> <God>. <laughs> he didn't murder her. Um, oh, uh, <laughs> thank but, heavens for small mercies. <laughs> yes. But, um, and... In the, re in the researching of Wake, um, so this is a much less exciting story, this is a library archive story, uh, but uh, I wanted to be very sure that I was getting things very accurate about um, missing persons advertisements and how they would have been worded and you know, what it would have looked like. And so I went to the National Library and was pulling old missing persons magazines and posters and circulars and reading through them. And I was flipping through them and I started noticing this weird pattern mm. that there are a lot of missing person posters for backpackers in the same area. Mm. And I was like, I wonder if anybody's looked at this, of like this pattern here. And it took me a couple of minutes to twig that I was looking at the missing persons oh, posters of the Ivan Milat victims. Mm. And it was just, <laughs> there was this poor librarian mm. who, um, as I was leaving, he was like, oh, how'd you go? And I just like word vomited about what I'd found. And he was just like, oh, great. Um, <laughs> but um, you can sort of see the influence of that. Um, it's such a famous case mm. that I think everybody's a little bit influenced by it, who yeah, mm. works in this genre. Um, there's a little bit of him in the, the Jan Henning Klausner character, yeah. who mm. is the Rainier Ripper, mm. and in particular the end of life elements mm. of how you do deal with a serial killer mm. who is still in prison but is um, this infamous figure who mm. is also just like, you know, his health is collapsing and working through end of life care mm. for mm. someone like that. Mm. 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 Ooh, I had a, a terrible experience when I was working on the Sunday Age when I had to ring up uh, somebody. In G one, of the, one of the girls who was missing was German. Mm. Oh. And I had to talk to her mother. Oh. Um, but she hadn't been found at that oh. stage. But, and and I, could, I could speak a little bit of German. And, uh, yeah, it was t oh, I really didn't want to do it, but I... I was told I had to do it. So she hadn't been She found. hadn't been found at that stage, and then I didn't talk to her subsequently. Oh, when, gosh. You know, that it's was... Just, I mean, it speaks, doesn't it, to all our terror, to all our, mm. you know, as people ourselves, as, as parents. As it, it's, it's, it's kind of the greatest Australian fear, isn't it, mm. to go, to be captured in I an think, isolated place. Yeah, and I, I don't know about you, but I've, since Ivan Milat... I think I've I've very few hitchhikers. Mm. Oh uh, yeah, you know, yeah. It's really. Uh, oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. And when we used to be picked up, people used to say to us, um, "We used to love being picked up by mums and they, <laughs> oh, women in their fifties because they would tell us off and they would give us food and water <laughs> and they'd say, have you had showers, girls?' And then they'd say, "Haven't you heard what's happening to the girls on the east coast?" So it was sort of creeping in in mm. that in that early that nineties, mm. wasn't mm. it? Yeah, where yeah, people yeah, stopped, reckon, you see less I of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about structure of, of <laughs> crime novels um, because it's a very... Uh, um, the Argentinian writer, um, José Luis Borges, mm. said, after you read detective fiction, other fictions seem shapeless. I love that. It's good, isn't it? Because, I mean, because when you think about it, you know... The, you have a, a murder, a mystery, or whatever, and you sort of, or you know, you're heading to some sort of solution 
in theory. Um, does, I mean, does that sort of structure give you a sense of um, security and freedom as you write? Do you think? Sorry, if that sounds like a rather convoluted question. No, I think it's an excellent question. I, <clears throat> I'm a big nerd about structure. Um, I love to read the theory on it, the you know, hero with a thousand faces. And, um, <clears throat> and it is true that crime fiction is a really structured genre. I think probably the only one that's more structured is romance. Um, yeah. to the point where there are ways you can deviate yeah, from the structure and romance that it will not be considered romance mm. anymore and you can't sell it as such. Mm. Um, with what are the deviations in romance if you, to when it can't be called romance? Murder. Yes. Oh. So if you have a murder, yeah, it becomes no, a crime true. novel. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Ah. I imagine. Interesting. Yeah. They can't die and they have to end happily. They have to right. be together at the end, mm -hmm. either permanently or at least for the foreseeable future. You can have a, fair, uh, you can have a love story where they break up at the end, mm. um, Gone with the Wind, for example. That's romantic fiction. If you try to sell it as romance, romance readers will get very angry. Oh, um, which, you know, it's the promise of the premise. Yep. Um, if oh. you deviate too much, oh. then you're just going to end with unhappy readers. Right. Mm. Um, so, I, I love structure, but I try not to focus too much of it in the early stages. I don't look at it in the outlining stages, and I don't look at it in the first draft. But when I'm re rewriting it and editing it, I do find it really helpful to look at those very formalized structures, the hero's journey, for example, and, and the stages. and it's often helpful to put what I've put together against those and mm. see how mm. it's lining up. And that often will highlight to me ways that, you know, it, it's a, helpful to help find the soggy middle where, you mm. know, I can't figure out why it's not working. Yeah, <laughs> I hate that. Yeah, but I think if you start from those structures, I mean, I think anybody who works in screenwriting is familiar with a book called Save the Cat. And that has gotten so formulized that you can see it in movies nowadays to a point that I think is getting detrimental. Um, yeah, so I wouldn't like to start out trying to do a traditionally structured crime fiction novel and make sure I'm hitting all of the beats. But after I've told my story, it can be a really helpful tool to mm. tighten it up again. Mm. Yeah, I'm probably the same. I mean, I don't plan when I, when I start writing. Like, I don't... Oh. Well, because... Because I kind of lose the joy if I do. So mm. I, uh, but now I, I usually find out who the killer is in my books at about 60,000 words. But now for this one that I'm doing this year, I think I know who it is and I'm about at f a 50. So I think it's, so it takes shape as I start writing it. Mm. But I am, that doesn't mean that it's just like a hot mess and I'm just writing anything. Like I have a core cast of characters. I have the landscape. I kind of know what's going to happen. But then, and I'm like you, so I do that, I, I do that first thing and then the killer comes to me and then, it, and then I have to go back and fix. And then I look at those structure things and say, okay, is it kind of, is it bo too boring here? Is there, you know, do I need some action here? But that's, in the first instance, I certainly don't do that. Mm. Mm. So when you get to the 60,000 word mm. point and mm. you, you think, oh, yeah, it's yeah, this, this one. person who's yeah. the murderer, mm. do you then have to go back yes. and you yeah. then sort of manipulate yeah. the yeah. narrative? So, you so sh usually I find it when I'm going for a walk or something, I'm walking in the bush or I'm in Mount you know, Chilton or something, the Pilot National, and I'm walking through there and I, I think, yes. It's Jason who did it, and then, and then I, it's true. and then it's true I idea. run, I run a million miles an hour back <laughs> home, and I, and I, but then absolutely, then I have to go back and do some red herrings and right. cut out things yeah, yeah, and yeah. just, you know, do a lot more work then. But it's, I really love it when I, that when moment. I, oh, oh, it's, mm. it's a joy, yeah, and a relief, <laughs> yeah, and a relief, yeah, to my yeah, publishers. So, it's so how far, <laughs> how far have you got without knowing? So I think Cutter's End, I didn't know. I think Cutter's End, I was at about 64,000 words and I was really panicking. I was going, who the hell did this? I don't even know why this person, who did it? And, uh, but the, the suspects were narrowing then and I was starting to think, 
and, and then yeah, and then in the editing stage, I changed it again slightly so that it was someone. But um, but but I I, I love writing that way because it, it it brings me joy. And and they talk. Um, Kate talked about this beautifully in the panel just before about bringing joy. And um, I think that the moment I don't have that anymore, I'm I'm just not going to write anymore. I, you know, mm. I'm a teacher. I've got another job I can go back to. I, uh, I the moment I start finding it boring or hard work, I'm not going to do it anymore. Mm. Yeah. Is that like you too, Shelley? Is that like you? <laughs> or do you le I'm do you um, like, w do you learn things about yourself when you when you finish your when, by the time you finish your books or when you write them? Do you hmm. I don't know. I think I find out. You what learn I care you're not about. a serial killer. I learn. <laughs> yeah, I, I probably no find out what's important to me, like um. You know what I like, how I like justice to occur, or how I would like um, males to behave. Mm. You know, more that that kind of thing, I suppose. But yeah. nothing, nothing specifically. What about you? What about you, yeah. Shelley? Yeah, no, <clears throat> I do have a strong tendency to unconsciously put parts of myself into mm. the book. So, I mean, a fairly um, infamous example is from Wake. Um, there is a scene in which a character is bitten by a snake. Yes. And I was um, talking to my husband about it, um, who was, you know, reading through the first draft. And he was like, I'm really look I know from, he'd seen the outline, and he's like, I'm really looking forward to getting to that chapter because you've been bitten by a snake, so that's going to be really accurate. And I was like, oh, I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> oh, that's hysterical. <laughs> I was like, I didn't set out to write a snake bite scene because I'm a world expert in being bitten by a snake, but... Um, yeah, it was just, I guess it was just there in the subconscious, and, um, yeah. It is a great scene. Yeah, it's <laughs> a great scene. <laughs> certainly rang true to me when I read it. Mm. Oh, God, it's horrible. <laughs> now, um, we've probably reached the point uh, in, the, in the hour no that we return. have together. Mm. Point of no return. We've reached the 64,000 yes. word mark. <laughs> When, when we're going to get some really, really difficult questions, because I've given you such a gentle time. Mm. Now, um, does anybody have a question for either Shelley or Marg? And there's a question at down there. I'm a huge... On? Right. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of the Limestone Coast. I've been down it several times. There's a fantastic story about a whole horse and cart yes. disappearing. <laughs> Yeah. And then they fa bits of it sort of started floating out to sea. I guess it'd be a bit tempting to include something like that in a, in a book. <laughs> I know. Well, there's one sinkhole where there's a car, there's an old Tirana down the bottom of the sinkhole, <laughs> and divers go down there and they challenge themselves to try and read the odometer to see how many Ks, but then they get narked, they get nitrogen <laughs> narcosis. So they come up and they go, oh, some say this, and some, so no one quite knows. But yeah, there's lots of things down there. This isn't a question to anybody in particular, but Jason, you mentioned that crime fiction is in many ways contemporary. I'm wondering if that means that unless a series is really exceptional, does it have a limited shelf life, so to speak? Ooh. I'm thinking of the first Australian crime series I came across as a lad was the Arthur Upfield Boney series. You never hear, hear of him anymore. Does that mean that those issues are no longer part of the Australian psyche? Or does it mean that maybe they weren't the greatest of stories in the first place? Um, Interesting. Um, well... Well, Shelley. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... Look, um, I do think, like, things naturally will... Um, float out of the public consciousness. I own an Arthur Upfield book. Oh. Um, you can still buy them in bookshops. Yep. And there was a wonderful um, ABC short about an Arthur Upfield true story um, that's fascinating because one of his cases, he was discussing it while he was working at a, a station and he was discussing his plan for the book. And somebody overheard him and thought, that sounds like a really good idea and stole his idea 
to commit an actual murder. Wow. And so when his book came out, the police contacted him because they're like, this is suspiciously similar to a real murder that happened quite close to where you were living That's right. at this time. And luckily they solved it. So interesting. Someone else. Mm. Yeah, but I think the interesting thing about crime fiction is that there's also a really strong tradition of historical crime fiction. And so I would hope that like when stories stop feeling contemporary, they just sort of drift gently into becoming historical fiction. And, you know, then it just comes down to whether they're mm. still on shelves and still able to be discovered. I mean, I think, I think uh, Arthur Upfield fits into that category now of, yes, of historical fiction. Yes, was contemporary. Uh, and there's, there's the, um, the question of his, his um, main, main character, Napoleon Bonaparte, who's a... Who's half Aboriginal, half white. Uh, I think there's a sort of sense of awkwardness yes. about, and some I've I read. I haven't read them for many, many years, but um, a little bit clunky, I think, possibly. Mm. Uh, yeah. I think that you know, writing styles and what readers yeah. are looking for changes over mm. time. I, I think of Barbara Bainton. You know, Barbara Bainton. No, hardly anyone even knows who Barbara Bainton is. You know, she when she wrote Bush Studies around. Mm. You know, I think in 19. 110, and um, it's the most wonderful, you, that's historical crime, but it speaks to the fears, the psychological fears that we still have mm. today, very mm. present. Mm. Yeah. Another question? Um, I have one. Oh, uh, can you hang on for the microphone, please? Um, I was delighted that Gary Dish is one of your favourites, because um, he has been with me, and I really enjoy reading, but audiobooks as well mm. and I just wondered what control do you have over the narrators of the audiobooks one small disappointment I come from South Gippsland and um, there's some interesting names of towns down there Kui Rup and Turidan yes. and the names in one of his books set down there were almost not quite recognisable oh. and I was very surprised that that hadn't been edited out do you mm. Um, enjoy ha putting your books out to audio books? Well, I, I don't have much say over it with mine. So pe um, my publishers um, have their own Penguin, I guess, will have their own audio division or whatever. And then I know that they, when my books were going to audio, they sent me the auditions for the actors who had auditioned for Mark Ariti. And, um, and we listened to it, my family and I all listened to each one. Then we listened to the next one. And I said, I really like... Uh, this guy, and they said, that's great, we've chosen the other one. <laughs> uh, but, he's, but he's turned out to be brilliant. So no, I would say I have virtually no control over that. Mm. Yeah. But I'm ho okay with that. Yeah, it's a bit of, um, you know, they try to make me feel included, but ultimately <laughs> um, there's, yeah. there's so many factors, mm. like it's actor availability, actor interest. Mm. Um, what was really wonderful with the two audiobooks is um, Jackie Brennan was my narrator, who it's great to have the same one across both. Mm. Like, as an audiobook listener, I really love it when it's always the same narrator. And for Ripper, she actually sent a list of words that she wanted me to help her with oh, the pronunciation of, which I was really thrilled by. Like, that's such, um, I think that's just something that she opted to do, that mm. she wanted to get it right. And things like, you know, the, the name of the town and certain mm. character names. Um, yeah, so, you know, I didn't necessarily have the option to insist that things be pronounced a certain way, but she came back to me and wanted to check in on things, which mm. was wonderful. Yeah, that's good. Mm. That's good. Um, got time for at least one more. In the book or in real life? Um. <laughs> the question was, what sort of snake was it? Yeah. Both in the book and in real life. Yeah, so in real life it was just a black snake, which um, didn't... Just. Just, well, yes, because um, I didn't even need antivenine. Um, it was a, a go-away bite. He didn't... Um, in, I didn't end up with any venom, which is wonderful. Where was uh, it? Where, in, where did you get bitten? Uh, on my knee. On your knee? And in Lostock, New South Wales. Um, but I was at a scout camp, so literally every adult within a three-mile radius <laughs> had a first aid certificate. So I, you know, I was collected by the Westpac helicopter and taken oh. to the hospital. Oh. It was very exciting for a 12-year-old. 
Um, <laughs> and in the book, um, it was a brown snake. So I did make it more dramatic and more dangerous, one of the world's deadliest snakes. And, you know, he gets off um, much more severely than I did. He has to go to the intensive care unit and receive treatment and potentially long-term effects. Okay, one final question from me, unless... Um, oh, hang on, no, there is a question at the back. And it's got to be quick. Oh. <laughs> and the answers have got to be quick. Oh. Okay, maybe not mine then. Okay. Uh, my question was just about um, violence against women. So a lot of crime fiction draws attention to violence against women. But sometimes as a consequence of that, it means that there's like male detectives and the women are the victims. And how do you guys like factor in sort of, I guess, empowering women and, and sort of, you know, pushing back against that kind of women are victim, men, you know, solve, solve, you know, or protect women, that kind of thing. How do you kind of, how do you mm. think about that and how do you feel about that in crime fiction? Mm. Um, so in mine, my short answer is it's often women who, um, who exert the, uh, the solution. I'll put it that way, the solution <laughs> to the crime. Um, or it's women who are, the, who are empowered to make the decisions and, and exact revenge. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, it was a really conscious decision on my part, moving into writing Ripper to try to move away from that. Um, because with Wake, it started from a very specific type of story I wanted to tell, and so I was somewhat locked into the victim being a young girl. Um, and in Ripper, there are four murder victims overall, um, one of which had to be a cisgender woman, but the others I consciously decided that the rest would actually be male victims. And so I don't know that that's necessarily, um, you know... I don't know. Um, they, it's always difficult. Yeah. But there are some really wonderful books out there that centre female detectives as well. Um, Danuka McKenzie's books. She's um, great. Detective Kate Miles is wonderful. Um, uh, Hayley Scrivener's book um, right. has a female detective as well. I think there's a prize in Britain, isn't there? For, yes. For, which Jock won. Mm. Jock Sarong won mm. for... A crime without a female crime body? Crime without a female body or crime without violence to women. Anyway, um, I'm sorry, we've run out of time. Um, uh, thanks for coming. Both Shelley and Marg will be outside signing copies of their books afterwards. Um, at one o'clock, if you've got your book signed by then, you can come back in and, and listen to Paul Delgano talking to Kate Milden Hall about the hummingbird effect. And, um, and then at three o'clock, I'm going to be back here talking to the wonderful Pip Williams. So mm. thanks very much. Thanks so and much. please thank. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Shelley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.